VEQT from Vanguard and XEQT from BlackRock are two very popular asset allocation ETFs for Canadian investors, and for good reason. They provide exposure to almost every stock in the world, and they're very low cost. It's a great option for equity investors here in Canada. So if the performance of these two ETFs might be very similar over time, what's the difference and how do you decide which one you should use in your portfolio? Well, at the end of the day, this video is not about making a recommendation to you, but just giving you all of the differences so that you can make a decision for yourself. So in this video, I'm going to discuss a whole bunch of the differences between the two ETFs. I'm going to explain the different holdings, the fees, distributions, the risk and volatility metrics, the performance, and finally a bit of a wild card category that really made the difference for me when I was deciding which one of these ETFs that I would want to use in my own portfolio. Hey, I'm Evan. I'm a certified financial planner professional here in Canada. And today we're going to be going over the differences between these two very popular ETFs, XEQT and VEQT. Let's get into the holdings. Okay, let's take a look and see what's actually inside these ETFs. So both of them are what we call ETFs of ETFs or fund of funds because their underlying holdings aren't specifically the individual stocks that they own. It's actually different index ETFs that uh, comprise the, the entire holdings of both of these ETF products. So Vanguard is over on the left here and uh, I've got the iShares or the, the BlackRock um, option over here, XEQT. So let's look at Vanguard here first. They've got four different ETFs inside of them, and they've got a U.S. total market, the Canada All Cap ETF. This one is called the Developed All Country X North America. So think of places like Japan and the UK. Those are probably some of the bigger options uh, inside that one. Probably Australia, um, France, Germany, those kind of places would be included there. And emerging markets, those would be things like Brazil and China and India and a few other countries as well. And I'm going to get into a few more of the specifics about that in a second. So over here on the XEQT side, you've got the S&P total U.S. market, very similar. And then the TSX capped composite, the MSCI EFI IMI ETF. I'm going to explain that one there. That's from uh, an index provider called MSCI, Morgan Stanley Capital International. And EFI stands for Europe, Australasia, and the Far East. And IMI is the Investable Market Index. Boy, it's a lot of acronyms that you'll never need to know, but just so you know what all those letters mean. And the final one here is Emerging Markets. Okay, so what are the actual differences here? So if we look at first the U.S. holdings, we've got 45.69% from the Vanguard and over uh, in the BlackRock fund, we've got 44.73. Very, very similar, but there is a slight larger weighting to U.S. stocks in the Vanguard fund in VEQT. Now, this could change a little bit from year to year, month to month, day to day, even just depending on when they rebalance and um, what the performance of those individual indexes has been. So I wouldn't look into that one too much. And if we look at Canada, the difference between the Vanguard allocation to Canada and the BlackRock one is probably the most significant difference in terms of country. It's, it's just shy of 5% more in the Vanguard fund. Before we go too much further, you're going to see a bunch of letters that are similar in both of them, but different from each other. So FTSE is a index provider that Vanguard uses, and MSCI is the index provider that iShares uses. Why does this matter? Well, it doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things, but they are different, and this whole video is about the differences between these two products. So the FTSC Canada All Cap Fund uses a different number of holdings than the TSX Capped Composite does. It doesn't really matter at the end of the day, but they are a little bit different in terms of what they include in the Canada portion. And then if we go forward to the developed X North America option, which is the MSCI version over here, they just call it something completely different, but this is the developed market index that they're using. The, um, the BlackRock fund XEQT actually is quite a bit more in international than Vanguard does. And one of the interesting wrinkles between these two index providers is how they categorize developed versus emerging markets. Again, it's not that big of a deal, but it is something that's perhaps interesting at the very least. So just for one example here, MSCI or Morgan Stanley Capital uses 
South Korea as an emerging market country, whereas FTSE categorizes them as a developed market. And so, you know, depending on how those perform and what weights they are, it could have a minor difference in terms of the performance here, just because the indexes are comprised slightly differently just based on the definition of the countries that they use. So a little bit more emerging markets in the Vanguard fund, but again, depending on how an emerging market is defined, at the end of the day, the country weightings might be very, very similar between the two. So all this to say, the differences are there. I don't know if they're meaningful enough to actually have a distinct difference in performance over a long period of time. We're going to get to performance in a second here, but if you're deciding between these two, Maybe you could take a look and see um, how much Canada you might want to have in your portfolio versus international. It could be a small factor for you to consider, but meaningfully, these are pretty close to the same. Okay, now let's take a look at the fees between the two ETFs. Again, I've got Vanguard on the left, and I've got the BlackRock XEQT over on the right. These are copies of the ETF facts, and they include all a lot of the details that an investor would need to know about the product to make an informed decision. And so the fees are all included here as well. So taking a look at the Vanguard fund, let's start with the first cost of operating, which is the management expense ratio. That's probably the one that you're most familiar with. And the Vanguard fund has a 0.24% MER and the XEQT fund uh, has a 0.20% MER. So XEQT is a little bit cheaper, but once you're this cheap in the grand scheme of things, it's all cheap. It's not that big of a deal. It's uh, very, very similar between these two products. So let's go into some of the other costs that you might not be familiar with so you can continue to know a little bit more about the true cost of owning an ETF. Down here, if you scroll down to the pricing information, it shows the range of, uh, of pricing over the last 12 months and the average bid ask spread. So when you trade a stock or you trade an ETF, there's the price that a seller is willing to accept and the price that a buyer is willing to pay to buy that product. And there's usually going to be a difference there depending on how liquid these products are. And so the larger the bid ask spread is, the more expensive it is for you as a buyer and or investor in that fund. Now, that's a one-time cost. It's not an ongoing fee that you pay continually, but it is a cost that is worth considering. So over time, the average bid-ask spread for the Vanguard fund was actually a little bit cheaper. So it was 0.044%, whereas the average bid-ask spread for XEQT is 0.06%. So again, this isn't meaningful, but that can change day to day, month to month, year to year. And so it is worth taking a look at when you're trading products that are on an exchange to actually take a look and see what that bid ask spread is to make sure that you're not overpaying for something just in terms of trading costs. Now, final cost that I'm going to showcase here is something called the trading expense ratio. This is listed separately from the MER and... Um, it's shown here on the ETF facts. So over here on the Vanguard fund, I've got the trading expense ratio here. And believe it or not, 0%. It's probably not actually $0, but when you round it to the value of the fund, it ends up being 0.0%. The trading expense ratio for XEQT is a little bit higher at 0.01%. That could be more of a reflection of the actual volume or the size of the ETF. Uh, the Vanguard fund is bigger, and I'm not sure what it was at the time of building these ETF facts, but that could be a factor there as well. So anyways, those are the, the costs of owning and purchasing both of these ETFs. If you go back and look at the actual numbers, they're almost exactly the same, even if you factor in the bid-ask spread being a little bit higher for XEQT. It's the difference of about 0.01% between the two, and that is not a meaningful difference to make a decision in my mind. Distributions is a third category we'll take a look at. And distributions, you can probably think of them kind of like a dividend. When you have an ETF or a mutual fund, there are different types of income that those products will earn over time. And there could be capital gains or dividends and things like that. And these funds are required to distribute them back to you as the shareholder. I'm not going to talk about yield or anything like that because it doesn't really matter. A distribution yield is just paying money that's already incorporated into the value of the ETF back to you. And so it's kind of just like moving money from your right pocket over to your left pocket. It's not that big of a deal. 
and it's not actually a source of return either. Again, it's just kind of moving value from one side to the other. It will be taxable to you if you own these products in a taxable account. And so that is a factor to consider there. If you are spending your distributions out of these funds, this is a factor to probably consider just because of the timing of when they're distributed back to you. So the Vanguard Fund, VEQT, will only do an annual distribution, whereas the BlackRock XEQT does a quarterly distribution. So you'll just get a distribution of the income from the fund on a more regular basis. It's not more necessarily. It might be marginally different between the two, but the holdings are largely the same. So I wouldn't anticipate a significant difference there. But if you are spending that money that comes back to you instead of reinvesting it, especially not automatically reinvesting it, then you will have money in your account more often from XEQT. Again, that's not a source of return. It's virtually irrelevant in the grand scheme of things, but it is worth considering for those of you who value the distribution and the frequency of the distribution. All right, now we're going to take a look at risk and volatility between these two funds. Over here on the screen, forgive me for the different aspect ratio here. I couldn't quite figure that out. But things that we can take a look at here, again, Vanguard is over here on the left. And a standard deviation is a common one to take a look at because that's how volatile the fund is. And if we're looking at a three-year average here, the standard deviation for the last three years is 12.46. And over here with XEQT, standard deviation of 12.72. These are nearly identical. So in terms of volatility, you probably won't expect much of a difference between the two. But if we take a look at something called the maximum drawdown, this is how much the fund went from its absolute peak to its lowest low during that three-year period of time. And for the Vanguard fund, VEQT, there was a maximum drawdown of 16.85%, whereas XEQT during that same period of time to the day had a maximum drawdown of 17.54%. So that is largely incorporated in that difference in standard deviation. It's not that big of a deal between those two, but it's worth considering, I guess. Um, on a go-forward basis, I'm not sure what the differences are going to be because no one knows what the future is going to be, but the difference in volatility is largely just due to the fact that the holdings are marginally different between the two, and that's how those different weightings between those countries played out over this short period of time of three years. Now, before we get into the performance section, if you're liking this video so far, just click down below that little thumbs up button that really lets YouTube know that you appreciate this video and other people like yourself might like it too. And while you're down there, the subscribe button is dangerously close. So if you're willing to subscribe and see more content just like this, that would be awesome. Thanks. Okay, now the thing that everybody wants to know was the difference in performance between the two. So we don't really have a long track record here. Let's just be honest about that. Three years is not that long. Five years isn't that long. So the XEQT ETF doesn't have a full five-year track record yet even. And so three years is kind of the best period of time that we have to compare to. I don't really like comparing over that short period of time, but it is what it is. And that's, uh, that's all we have. So Vanguard, 7.99%. This is current as of April 4th. And um, the XEQT ETF, same period of time, three-year return of 8.29. So it's a little bit better for XEQT on a backward-looking basis. On a go-forward basis, you never know. Largely, the discrepancy in that period of time is that a lot of markets outside of Canada performed a little bit better. And so because of Vanguard's higher weighting to Canadian stocks, it performed marginally less. Now, the inverse could be true for the next three years, and no one really knows that. And so I wouldn't base my decision based on this very, very, very small sample size. One thing to look at, though, if you have ever been on Morningstar, you can take a look at this index return here. And so over that period of time, the index return 8.48 versus the ETF's return of 7.99. And you might be thinking, wait a second, this is an index fund. Why does it not have the performance of the index? And you say, okay, well, maybe it's fees. No, not necessarily, because the, the total fee is less than the difference there. But when you look at the index, you can look down here and you can see it is the Morningstar Global whatever <laughs> the acronym is down here. And then if we just take a look over here um, at the portfolio section, we can see a little bit more of what the index actually includes. 
Now, the index has way more in the U.S., quite a bit more international, and virtually nothing in Canada because the index is global weightings of the stock market based on market cap. And Canada represents about 3% of global market cap. So that's what the index includes. So even though these are index funds, because they are comprised of different indexes, comparing it directly to the global equity market isn't always going to be a fair or realistic comparison because it is meaningfully different. Anyways, just something that I thought would be valuable to mention as you're evaluating these ETFs as a Canadian investor. Okay, now if you're still with me so far, it's time for the final wildcard segment of evaluating the differences between these two. And we're going to look at the companies themselves, BlackRock versus Vanguard. BlackRock is a publicly traded company, which means that they themselves are traded on the stock exchange. Just like any other public company, they're objective is to maximize profits and value for shareholders. And so as a result, the products that they produce are designed to maximize profits for shareholders. This is fine. This is not some sort of boogeyman type of thing. That's just expected. I only say that because it contrasts completely with Vanguard. And when Vanguard was founded, they were established with what's called a mutual structure, which means that they are actually owned by their U.S. domiciled mutual funds and ETFs. And because investors are the ones that own the mutual funds and ETFs, the end investor is actually the net owner of Vanguard. It's kind of like a co-op. So it's really interesting because Vanguard as a company has an incentive to decrease their fees over time as opposed to maximizing profits. Now in Canada, there's a few nuances that are worth considering with both companies. So with Vanguard, going back to that mutual structure, you might have picked up that I said it's based on the U.S. domiciled funds and ETFs that actually own the company. It's not the Canadian ones. So even though you might be a unit holder of a Vanguard fund here in Canada, you don't actually own any piece of Vanguard at all. And so there's there's kind of a disconnect there between the mutual structure and us as Canadian investors with Vanguard. However, Indirectly, we still benefit from that mutual structure in terms of how the company is designed and how their low cost priority filters down through their other jurisdictions throughout the world, including us here in Canada. Now with BlackRock, the Canadian nuance that's worth considering is that RBC, yes, that RBC, (laughs) uh, went into partnership with BlackRock back in 2019 to bring these ETFs up to Canada. And so I'm not sure how profitable a venture this is for RBC, but you can rest assured that they're not doing it out of the goodness of their heart either. So if you don't want to support another big bank in Canada, XEQT might not be the ETF for you. So to wrap everything up here, you might have noticed a few differences in each of these sections here, but some of them are really, really small, marginal at best. And so at the end of the day, pick the fund that you like the most and when in doubt, You can flip a coin and you'll probably be just fine. Even though there are differences between the two ETFs, on a go-forward basis, you never know what's actually going to happen. And so to use one performance versus one's holdings or anything like that as an excuse to say, oh, this one is obviously better than this one, it's just not. They're great products and they're potentially good options for you as an equity investor here in Canada. Now, last disclaimer here is that these ETFs are not for every investor and because they are all stocks. And if you are someone that does not have the risk profile to own a portfolio exclusively comprised of stocks, these ETFs might not be a good fit for you. So take a look at your risk tolerance and your preferences before making investment decisions for yourself. But this video was just uh, uh, taking a quick look at the differences between these two very popular ETFs. Again, if this was valuable or interesting for you, consider subscribing to see a little bit more from me. And uh, thanks so much for watching. We'll see another video.